Hello and welcome along to a very special episode of My Football Story from the Honest Football Podcast. This week, Charlie interviews actor Martin Delaney and it is a real fanboy moment for him because most importantly, among all his other brilliant work, Martin was star of Renford Rejects, a household favourite for many football fans of our generation. We talk about that in detail as well as Martin's acting career and his surprise involvement in the real football coaching world. So this one really is a cracker. We hope you enjoy it. Let's go and get into it. And I'm delighted to say that Martin joins us now. Um, Martin, I appreciate you've had a really busy day, you know, of all the various other interviews and things like that. So I appreciate you taking the, the time to, to talk to us and stuff. Oh, bless you. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I mean, look, I've gone old school. I've got like my, my rubbish headphones in and everything. But, uh, <laughs> and I was like, can he see me here? Like, this is all right. Um, no, yeah, I, but, I'm having issues with the light as well, so I won't worry too much about that. Yeah, and, uh, but it's a yeah. typical actor thing, right? I bet I bet everyone who comes onto your football podcast is asking, worried about the lighting, you know? Like, it's, no, no. <laughs> you know, I straight away, like, kicked off. I was like, okay, the guy's an actor. All right. No, no, could definitely not. No, I've got to be honest, my, my daughter's recently moved into a different room, but that used to be like an office for us. So the light, it was all perfect for that kind of stuff. But now, uh, alas, <laughs> I'm in the spare bedroom, hence the, the dodgy books. But... Um, anyway, no, do you know what, Martin? It'd be great to just talk to you about all, all things football, both in your career, yeah, but also your personal love of it. And what we always do with anyone that we have on the podcast is we just try and find out your first football memory. So maybe it'd be, you know, being down the park or a game that you watched, but what's the first ever memory of football that you have? The first memory of football will definitely be uh, my dad taking us uh, to the park, which was opposite our house. We moved into this house when we were like, when I was four. Um and the one, I mean, we would have played it in my old garden when I was a bit younger, but the memory that I have is is definitely my dad taking my brother Mike and I to Goddington Park, which is in Orpington, it's sort of in Kent, southeast London, Kent. And uh, we're going to that park, and my dad was, uh, he and his brothers were great footballers, really, really good. And my dad, at the level that he was playing at, was which wasn't, really really high up but played against a lot of pros when they were younger so played against like les seeley oh, right, right. my, my dad and les seeley had a a run-in i think when they played against each other <laughs> that was a center forward um and 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 so i remember going to the park with my dad um and my older brother mike just being like the football one right mm. i remember just thinking you know oh, i'm never going to be as good as him and also it was like i had different interests i remember like oh, my dad really did that thing or that sort of parental thing of really working him and trying to develop his football skills and I remember being the kid like on a tree like climbing a tree <laughs> and sort of like off in my own world but sort of observing them like remember watching them and I guess it's funny because we really did carve out these different lives like I uh, my, my dad loved film and, and tv comedy like he watched a lot of comedy American comedy British comedy but he watched a lot of film as well in our house and uh, we sort of went off my brother and I these two different branches like I I kind of was obsessed with watching film and, and comedy mm -hmm. TV with my dad but movies like Escape to Victory you know like yes, it's pretty yeah. low bar for football films right but like I remember watching Escape to Victory with my dad and my dad had such a great sense of humor um and the one thing that he always found so funny was that was that uh, Michael Caine was supposed to have been the captain of England before <laughs> he was in the prisoner of war camp and it was probably the heaviest Michael Caine had ever been in his career. Like, it was like he was clearly like a bit overweight. And my dad was like, first of all, how is he a captain of England looking yeah. like that? And also, how has he been in a prisoner of war camp with a beer belly like that? And I was like, so we, we, we loved Escape to Victory, but we loved it for all the comical reasons. Yeah. You know, we used to watch it and, and, you could tell the moments that were like ad libs. I remember one of the lines that really made us laugh was Michael Caine screaming at um, Sylvester Stallone to stay on the line and narrow the angle. And then <laughs> thinking, surely that surely that's impossible. <laughs> like, <laughs> you can't really narrow yeah. anything staying on the line. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just so my earliest memories of us are just being tiny. Um, yeah. But like beyond that. One of the memories that really sticks out in my head is that, uh, you know, my, my brother and I were both quite quirky kids, I think. Like, I was always off in my own world, like I say, like, using my imagination, yeah. playing on my own, like some sort of oddball. And my brother was quite similar with football. Like, he was incredibly uh, skillful and tricky. And, and 
Mike's got this memory. It'd be great, you know, to talk to him at some point. But Mike's got this mm. memory about how. Uh, I just sorry, sorry for people that really don't know anything about us um, or me or anything. But of course, which is everyone. But um, no, my no. brother Mike uh, was a was a pro footballer, um, and he, he played football in in Germany um, and and had a relatively short career really. But um, uh, moved into football coaching uh, and now is one of the well, it is the world's best like technical advisor on film and TV. Like he, he, he does loads of amazing commercials and has recently gone into more narrative projects. And I've been an actor for a while and have been involved in a few football jobs, but, um, but actually uh, Mike was so skillful and he was one of the sort of pioneers of football freestyling, my brother. Yeah. But when he was a kid, he's got this memory of being at school and the teacher asking him to do a kick up, you know, keep you up. And, uh, and in him only being able to do like three, two or three and being really embarrassed right so my brother had this sort of mentality of like i'm not going to be shit at that like i'm not going <laughs> to be bad at that and and so i remember being at goddington park when i was a little bit older than this early memory but um i was getting i was my brother was off on his own and i was off on my bike and all i could see this this sort of like quite rough kid uh asked me if he could have a go on my bike he got on and then it was like he wasn't going to give it back <laughs> i was like um like is that coming back to me no all right no and he's like sort of riding around and i was thinking he's gonna take my bike this <laughs> and I, all i could see over the hill of godson park where i was down the bottom bit there's not much of a hill there but there's a little dip and all i could see was this football going up in the air like and back and down <laughs> the other side of this hill and it was my brother practicing and I remember screaming for help. Anyway, it was resolved. My brother did a good job at, at being the big brother and solving it. But my brother always worked on his skills and his tricks mm. on his own like that. And uh, yeah, and became one of the sort of pioneers of football freestyling. Mm. Beca- before it became, uh, I guess before the tricks became kind of other and like not really looking like football tricks, if you know what yeah. I mean. You know, now that there's so much flair to it that it's not mm. really quite football. Um, but he, yeah, he went and did the sort of skills shows all over the world, mm. you know, and, and, and amazing, amazing sort of uh, match venues and stuff after he, after he was a pro. There was probably a sort of time where even having those sort of skills, you almost um, not made an outcast, but, you know, particularly way football was probably when we were growing up. It, there was a few Absolutely. players who were a bit like that, but it wasn't really as encouraged. That's the word I'm looking for. Sorry, probably what yeah, it is so nowadays, it's, you know. So it is, yeah, yeah, it's a really good point. I think, you know, certain, that was what was hard for my brother being... Mm quite a sort of slight guy he was yeah. only about he's only my brother's only like an inch or so taller than me so we're not tall lads he's probably about five ten um and and we weren't we weren't big and so my brother trying to be a pro at the age that he was trying to be a pro was bombarded with that like you're not a big guy kind mm. of crap that had come out of in, come out of english football yeah. there was a there yeah. was as you say almost a disdain for skill mm. and tricks but my brother you know like a lot of like smaller players like Messi like Zola couldn't get kicked off the ball like it just wasn't going to be it wasn't going to happen mm. but it, but the the physique of him and the idea that he was a skillful player that was that definitely um rubbed people i think in mm. in, in the in the british scene um and 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 it was only when you know when 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 my brother um was weirdly he was just he randomly doubled he got a job basically he where, where i'd started acting um he he sort of joined a sports agency um to see if he could get some sort of like kind of work to sort of keep himself going he was already a qualified coach he was working for crystal palace i think at the time and he would have been offered a job for crystal palace as a football coach locally and then he landed this job to double as del piero on right. on, on, a, on a on a predator <laughs> advert and i don't know if you remember the old predator commercials but there was there was one where I think it was called, you, people wouldn't know the title of them because it was always like the media packs, but it was the one where Beckham was really young and Gaza was in it. And it was the idea that these these guys came out and played against themselves. They played against clones of themselves and yes. one team wore the Predator. I remember shirt. that, yeah. So my brother landed this job to double for Del Piero. And... They're amazing. I mean, you know, we know that these commercials look brilliant mm. and stuff on television now, but they're like films. Like they take like they, a commercial in the UK takes like a day to film, like a couple right. of days. You have a couple of different locations. 
they would spend like two, three weeks doing right. these football ads because there's so much because the football had to be good. Like they wanted yeah. it to look cool and, and to sell really sell the brand. And that's a difference when you look at a football commercial versus a film where the, mm. the, the, the narrative is about about the people. And and that's where we've got such a low bar for football films because the bottom falls out of the, the technical elements of football and there's not enough passion behind it or time. And, and, but on these big commercials for Adidas and Nike, and that was the star, you know, it was all about getting the, the, the play to look good. Um, so my brother landed this job doubling for Del Piero. And I remember the Crystal Palace guy trying to have a word with him saying he shouldn't do it. I think it was right. because it would take him out of work for a few weeks. Right. In the end, he, he backed down and, and let my brother go and do it. And on the job, my brother impressed people so much with his skill as well that the technical advisor or choreographer on that job was a guy called Hansi Muller, who was a centre forward uh, in the 70s, 80s, a uh, brilliant player, played for Stuttgart, uh, VFB, and, um, and he's played in Italy for a while. Um, and he was so impressed with my brother that he said to my, he, he ended up saying, look, I really want to take you to Germany right, and, right. And, and see if you can be a pro over there. And he met with my dad. And I remember going to that meeting to sort of like see if it was okay. Yeah. He made this pitch and he said, I'm, I'll take him. He had young kids at the time, Hansi. He, he, um, he had two children. Um, and he said, look, I'll take him. I'll, get, I'll sign him with an agent. And between us, we'll manage him and try and turn him into a pro. And, uh, and my dad was like, yeah. And so oh. England had sort of turned their back on my brother or mm. not really given my brother the, the chances that, that could have happened. And it was that exactly what you're talking about, that thing of what, what, what is it, what, how do we feel about skill in this yeah. country or how did we feel about it? And, um, and whenever you see a player like that, the, the, the off, the, often the reaction was like, I want to kick that guy up in the air. That was the yeah. sort of response from like players. And uh, yeah, my brother signed pro in Switzerland, actually. He was a, in, a, in German sort of uh, second division clubs for a while. Then he signed pro in Switzerland, was at a team called Schaffhausen for a while. Had time, he had a little bit of time at Hertha Berlin and, and Stuttgart right, wow. Kickers, which is Stuttgart's second team. And, uh, and I think really just got a little bit disillusioned with the politics of it. Mm. I think he, you know, he was missing home. Um, he learned German in a, in a few months and, and, and played there for a while. But in the end, just came back and, yeah. and, and built a coaching school. And, uh, and that was always my side job. You know, when I wasn't acting, I, was, I, I qualified as a, as a coach. I'm, I'm a UA for B licence coach. Mm. And I ended up working with my brother, developing the company. And that was what I did when I wasn't acting. Yeah. Because I had this sort of, these roots in football. Um, I was going to ask you about that later on, but seeing as you sort of brought it up now in terms of how how do you balance that? Because, and, you know, I'm not a UA for B coach, but, you know, just sort of coach local teams. And it it can be demanding on the time and, you know, yourself in the middle of a season, there's commitments, isn't there? You know, whether it be training every week or how do you, obviously, given the nature of your job as well, how would you balance that? And, you know, how does that sort yeah, of look to you, if that makes sense? It, it, look, it's, it's very different for me now. Like, I really don't have the time to coach mm. and, it's, and it's, it's hard. I miss it. It's, mm. Look, it's not, um, it, it, it's not really, unless you're going to go at it full throttle like anything, there's not really a profession to be made of football right. coaching at that level, um, unless you're really going to throw yourself in. My, my younger brother, Pat, was also a coach and he worked out of the States. And there's more, there's more, more room for a decent career as a as a as a football coach in the US and for years my younger brother was a a coach in, out of Seattle and and when right. he was living there he's now gone into to education and teaching but he's still involved in sport obviously but but um in the UK it was something that I did we ran a, a coach a football coaching school and, and actually more of a, a sports coaching eventually but a football coaching school primarily which still exists and I I don't really work in anymore um called the Skills Academy in our local right. area we were partnered with the biggest provider of sport in London at the time, which was Bromley My Time. Right. Bromley had like a load of sort of gyms they owned and, and a tennis mm. centre that and a Radkanu trained at. And right. there was lots of, they owned all these different sort of sports sites. And we, we won a tender, excuse me, we won a, a partnership to, to work with Bromley My Time, which had been held by Crystal Palace before. Right. Um, and we sort of, nudge them out of the area really yeah. like our coaches had a really good reputation what was really important when when mike had set up the company was that football coaching had to be high quality mm. and i think that was 
he'd been he'd seen coaches that were just I I don't want to knock it because it was there was a lot of young people involved. There was young kids, but they didn't really they didn't have the knowledge. And it wasn't mm. just about passing a your level one badge or your level two badge because yes, you need to do that. Of course, that's the route to coaching. But I think what was important for my brother is that the quality had to be there. Yeah, you needed the type of person who was passionate about the young people and their development, and not just the good young people. Mm. You know, you needed to have that coach who could spot the the weaknesses in 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 lesser players, if you like and know how to help them to really enjoy the process. And that's what I really admire my brother for, really, is that not the, the filming work that he's gone on to do, and, yeah. and which, which has been amazing. I mean, the, especially the last film he's done, it's, it's, his work is excellent in it. But the, the coaching, the grassroots passion mm. for young players with my brother was really about let's lose the highly competitive nature of it at a young age, make sure they really, really enjoy it so they've got the staying power of a young athlete that you want them mm. to have and try and lose that really high pressured, um, a tough environment that kicks kids out of football when they're too young. Yeah. And, and that was, that was really, really important. And if you look at the coaches that my brother still hires, the, it's like they're good people. Ultimately mm. the morality of these people is really high. They're really, really qualified. That's the base level. But most yeah. people end there we have ongoing development and training that we have with those coaches and we're looking for a certain type of person. And mm -hmm. I think that's, that's, that was always the, the remit when I worked there and worked with Mike is that we wanted to find the right person. Mm. And um, yeah, it was, it was lovely. I, I miss coaching for sure. I miss it's it. quite interesting you say that actually, because I think it's not to demean it or anything. The things you're talking about are actually fairly simple when you think about it, but it's amazing yes. that in this country, we still can't seem to get that balance right. You know? And I think like you say, obviously you and your brother have, have, uh, have been very successful on that but like you said there's lots of people out there who for one reason or another it's not you know not going to talk about them but it haven't got that mix right but when you think about it, it, it it's a bit strange isn't it really yeah and i don't want to knock any other companies no, no, no. for a while we were partnered with 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 charlton in the local area as well and and you know there's some good community level stuff at charlton but we mm. still felt like as a personal business as a smaller coaching school that wasn't affiliated to a club really even though we had various partnerships throughout mm. the time it was important to keep that kind of non-franchise vibe about it where mm. you, you sort of everything gets watered down. You yes. need to have eyes yeah. on it and you need to, otherwise you can't retain the quality. Mm. And it's, it's, you know, we, we had young players, you know, play one, one lad who went through us played for Ireland, you know, a couple of young yeah. female players who turned pro um, uh, a, a couple of players who played for the lionesses that came through us. Uh, a young player that I had that I did one to one with who ended up at, Ch at Chelsea for a while. And we developed really good players, but ultimately at the, at, at the early stages, it was all about how do you get these people to enjoy the game, properly yeah. enjoy the game and continue their learning mm. um, and, and really understand that you're developing a whole player. You know, we were used to coming out of Britain when I was a youngster, like I say, the, you know, big, you know, the yeah. England had this sort of like big, tough player image if, and actually, it was, it's crazy because we lost the kind of interest and passion for players like Stan Bowles. You know, yeah. going back to Renford Rejects or whatever, yeah. but players who were skillful and George Best. And we'd somehow got into this sort of pendulum had swung and we decided that English football was all about a certain type of player, yeah. which is kind of crazy, I thought. Um, yeah, and, and, and ultimately, we just wanted kids to really enjoy themselves and, and, mm. and love the game. You know? Yeah, and I, I think it's, I mean, you mentioned always about Renford Rejects. And I, I promise, because I know there'll be some people who want to hear about that. I promise we'll get onto that. But yeah, it's just like the, I think that's <laughs> okay. the thing. I guess even, most of them will be surprised that I've been involved in football for real. That's what I want, <laughs> but if I'm honest, that's what I want people to highlight. And, I'm, you know, I'm sure you've done lots of, um, you know, not to take away from, but you've done lots about, you know, Renford Rejects and, we, you know, I've tried not to ask you the same sort of questions, really. So I suppose that's why it'd be really good yeah, to highlight that I mean, background and show the, do you know what I mean? That no, journey. Interesting. I, it is interesting as well, Charlie, because I've never really spoken about this side of things and mm. to, certainly to this extent, you know, yeah. uh, it's just, it was always, um, it was always, you know, the sports coaching and was always like my side mm. job at a certain point in my life. Like I say, I, I don't have the time for it anymore. I really mm. miss it. I'm sure yeah. when my son is, of a certain age, I'll, I'll try and go back into it uh, yeah. a, a bit more. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, some of my favourite memories, uh, I've got lots of wonderful acting memories, but some of my favourite memories mm. are actually my brother and I coaching 
in yeah. the Austrian Alps, you know, like uh, going and coach. We used to go to uh, uh, Kitzbühel and, and Seefeld every year and coach over there and work with mm. young, really talented Austrian players. Um, I loved that. I miss that. Yeah. You know, you know, it was a, we, we used to, I used to factor it in as part of my summer holiday. We'd go and do <laughs> like two weeks in Austria and it would be like, we'd stay in these incredible hotels and uh, we did a camp in China and stuff and I, I, and, and a, a couple of camps in Munich in Germany and, and, and Stuttgart. I, and I really miss uh, going and coaching abroad and working mm. with those players. Uh, and we've made some amazing friends through football, you know, right. over the years. Hansi Muller, who took my brother out to Germany in the first place, is a, a great family friend, you know, right. still, you know. And it's incredible, really, because I think, you know, if you don't mind me saying, a lot of people would assume that friends you had through football would have probably been maybe through you know, Redford rejects. And, you know, I know, for example, yeah. like Stan Bowles, obviously was someone you, I've got a bit, I've just got to sound a sign. That was one of my favorite episodes because I, I know it sounds awful, but there's one point where I think the two of you completely head on collide. And it, it's a bit like, you know, he's a fairly elderly Stan Bowles at that point as well, isn't he? And yes, yeah. I just sort of wondered, like you mentioned about your whole football journey and all of this, you know, in terms of, of all the things you did at QPR at half time and all of that kind of thing, it, it did, um, yeah. I don't know where, where that ranks for you in terms of nerves and all that kind of stuff, but I don't, I don't know how well I would have yeah. come with that. You know, not only just being in front was, of all those people, but having Stan Bowles yeah. in front of you as well. It was an incredible experience. My, my dad, being like such a good centre forward, mm. loved players like Bowles mm. and Best and Dennis Law and, and all that sort of, sort of, sorts of players. So the fact that I was then, there was a lot that my brother and I did that was like just carrying out my dad's sort of life <laughs> dream somehow, you know. Uh, it was really weird. Um, but uh, Bowles and I remain really good friends. Yeah. I've not seen him for a while now, and I know he's not not very well. But he right. and my dad, yeah. before my dad passed away as well, he and my dad were really close. Mm. Um, and it's been amazing to to make friends with these people that my dad would have been observing from a distance at a younger age. You know, because he was of the era then that my dad would have been the sort of player that my dad looked up to. He's been mm. older, than, you know, a bit older than my dad, and so seeing players like that, and then getting to know them and, and yeah. becoming pals with them through myself, you know, mm. Stan was such a good crack and a really lovely man and, and, uh, and, and very charming when we did that episode together and, and we remain mates, you know, yeah. I was 17, you know, it's incredible, isn't it? I was, I was sort of going to yeah. allude to that, you know, I think a lot of people would mention about, you know, the Keown and Zola or that kind of thing, but the Stan Bowles one, cause I think for me, like, I always remember reading an article in the times must have about 20 years ago now. And it was sort of saying yeah. how really, in the, the, at the time when it was written, we'd sort of coached out the people like Stan Bowles, like you were almost bringing yeah. it back full circle, what you were saying earlier. And actually probably you get someone like Joe Cole as an example and managers were trying to teach him to defend and you wouldn't, you would never do that for someone yeah. like Stan Bowles or someone like that. And it's yeah. bringing it back full circle to what we were just saying. It's incredible, isn't yeah. it? Like that change in mentality almost in that sense. Absolutely. It was, it was really, a, what was tough about filming that episode, it was a wonderful episode and we actually shot it we shot it bang on halfway through the series of the first right. series. So there was 13 episodes. We each had two episodes written for us. Okay. And they were, and they were written very, very well in the first series, I mm. thought. Um, this was clearly the big budget episode. This was the one they were spending the money yeah. <laughs> on, series one. And so I felt very honored. And, 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 um, and, and what an experience. I mean, like... Um, it was incredibly nerve wracking, but what was even worse was that uh, I knew I had to go on the pitch and be shit, you know, like <laughs> I had to go on the pitch and like, and, and sort of like smash the ball over. So none of you know, no one in the crowd knew <laughs> what I was doing. You know, they just thought I was coming on, you know, to take some, have some one-on-ones and take some shots. So <laughs> it was, it was what isn't in the episode. And I've got to say, I've not really had a chance to talk about this. So this is great. Um, I, maybe I have one time. Uh, but it was in true Jason style. But when we walked out for real, and the announcer actually announced me as in the character name, like he didn't announce me as I am, he announced right. me as Jason Sutherby. So everyone was like, who's this Jason kid, you know? And uh, as we walked out through the tunnel, Stan rolls a ball in front of me, and uh, the goalie's already gone ahead and is in the goal. And from just like about another few yards at the edge of the area Stan had rolled it forward and I just pinged it and it went top corner <laughs> and everyone went crazy and uh, and and I was like and I know I'm not allowed to do that again <laughs> the rest of the filming and then we had to do the one-on-ones and it was like oh and people you know people you know making 
wanker signs and all sorts of stuff. It's really like, you know, like I was 17 and just getting absolutely abused. Um, but it was a lot of fun. It, we had a we had a big party that after we finished that episode that night, uh, Stan came and, and we mm. had a really lovely sort of halfway through the series party. And uh, it was a lovely experience making that show. It was a lot yeah. of fun. It, it, you know, it, it was it was a lot of fun. I'll try not to ask you too, too many of the generic questions, but were you aware when no, you were doing it how how far reaching it was? And the only reason I say that is I know this is really sort of geeky now, but our like little podcast logo is actually based on the Renford Rejects kit. And it's, it's just right, right, it's sort of transcended even for us. You know, I must have been uh, maybe eight or nine when the series first started. Yeah. But even yeah. things like recently, there's a, um, a company that have reproduced the, the, the actual Renford Reject shirt. I don't know if you're aware of this or not. Yeah, um, I heard. I heard. That, I heard the one of the guys. Uh, I think it's who's it who does the page, like does the page. Someone on there was like saying that they're going to send me one. I've got to show you because I never had a shirt, but someone else did actually send me mm. a replica a while ago. Yes, right, very good. Because I've ordered um, one myself. This is like. But this isn't this new one. This is like right. an old no, one no, that no. someone sent me, which is really lovely because I never had a shirt. I never mm. got to keep one. And uh, which I, I feel really like stupid about that I haven't got. Um, but someone sent me this replica. It's not quite right. It doesn't have the collar. And it no, no, no. It was definitely like the... But it was, uh, but it's not a bad effort. They did a, no. they did a good job. Um, yeah, it was, it was, I didn't, I didn't really know what it, like how good it would be. Like, I, I knew I liked the writing. I tell you what was amazing is that we had American producers and I knew that I knew that considering the age, like I was one of the youngest people in the show. There was a couple of guys who were a lot older, like Paul who played Bruno was in his twenties. So was uh, Matt who played Stuart. Um, and then there was a few really young ones like myself. Um, and then a, a sort of couple in between. Um, but I, knew i loved football i knew that i was nowhere near as good as my brother so i always felt like a bit of a reject um but i was all right at school but i was not i wasn't passionate about it in the same way which i think much to my father's probably chagrin but um but um so i, I felt like it was the perfect job for me to go mm. and we all had to play quite well because yeah. we had to have we had to be quite fit and we had to have moments of playing well but playing and you do see that there's sometimes when you see like a drop of the yeah. shoulder or something like that and you do realize that yeah you know obviously it's hard it's probably hard i don't know is it harder to act being rubbish than what it is actually playing normally i suppose i don't know, do you know what i mean with the actual yeah, ball so and stuff, like... it was a lot of fun like acting mm. like you're absolute crap it's, it's, it's good <laughs> you, know, you get you get away with a lot more especially if you actually do make some genuine mistakes you're like, oh, <laughs> oh I was meant that um you know <laughs> but um no, I, it was, I, I guess I just, I didn't know the impact in terms of it being like, you know, how long Nickelodeon were going to keep it mm. and run it for. It sort of spanned different generations. And that was what was incredible. Mm. Um, but I knew it was the first UK show that Nickelodeon were going to make. And I certainly wasn't expecting that it got nominated for a BAFTA in the yeah. first year. I yeah, was that's like, incredible, what? isn't it? Um, so it was quite fun. But was yeah, it in the drama was... category then? Am I right? I might, I might have read that wrong somewhere. It, 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 sort of... Um... Sorry, you can you'd know better than me, obviously. But in terms of that BAFTA, it was sort of yeah, in that yeah. Thing. It was like because it was you see you had like the junior BAFTAs, and so right. we, we the same, it was under like and I think that was the issue is it was like a really it was a it was a comedy drama, but there mm. wasn't a comedy there wasn't a comedy um, group for right. children's BAFTAs. So it was under the drama um, thing, and and uh, and we didn't we we didn't win it, but it was um, no, but still it's incredible. It was someone like. I can't remember what won it, but it was like, but it was such good fun. It was mm. such good fun. And, and, uh, and Matt Leach, who played Stuart, was still pals. Uh, Holly, who played Robin in the first mm. series, was still really good pals. Tom Weller, who played um, Stoker, went to my school, weirdly. Oh. We already knew, we knew each other, but not well. We knew each yeah. other. And, and, and um, so weirdly, we just, there's a bunch of people that I still stay in touch with and, and Roger Davis who played Vinny, who was probably the only really, really decent footballer. Mm. Um, and the, the irony that being that he never had to play. Uh, he lives in California now in LA, but we're still good pals. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I get to see, I get to see a few of them every now and then. Yeah. What happened in the afterwards in terms of, you know, obviously a bit later on in terms of work, you know, I mean, my, one of my favorite books was Catch 22, which I know you were in and all of this, but was there because of that, 
role in um, Renford Rejects? Was there a bit more of a push? Are people trying to give you a bit more football sort of based or... Or was it really just after that, you know, you know, yeah. you're in the direction of want a better phrase? That is interesting. Like, yeah, I mean, I, I did a, I did a football play. Like, there's a, a, a fantastic writer called Roy Williams who, who's uh, written some amazing sort of modern uh, plays over the years. He's a fantastic writer, and Roy uh, is a QPR fan actually, and and writes about his experience of like urban West London. Mm. Um, and and so when I was. Uh, in between series, when I was a bit older, when I was like 19, sort of series two or three, I, I did a Roy Williams play, which was a, right. about a, a five-a-side uh, team, a, a, about, a, about a, it was called Local Boy, and it was about a young professional, so it would be like someone like, I guess it would be like Rio Ferdinand back right. in the day, mm-hmm. coming back to his hometown and in and, 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 and working-class West London and seeing the kind of equivalent of him Right. Uh, younger, who I so I played the young lead, and 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 the person who chooses the wrong path, if you like. So I I the, the storyline for my character was much more catastrophic, and he was like a real like, you know, if you thought Jason was a pain in the ass in Renford Rejects, this kid <laughs> was the this kid was the real deal, and very right. much like a, a tough, rough kid, and and so I, I ended up doing that play. It was a really mo- very very moving, lovely play that we did at the Hampstead Theatre, mm. um, and then. I also did a, a, a short film that was made for the Hall of Fame Museum, which I think was sort of loosely based on some st- narrative around Joe Cole, actually. I don't know if he knows okay. it. But it was about a young lad who ended up playing for West Ham. And, um, and, and funny enough, it became like a proper family affair. My younger brother, Pat, played me when I was young. Um, and then my brother, Mike, did some of the skills and the technical right. stuff on the job. And it was shown at the Hall of Fame Museum in, 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 in the County Hall buildings in London uh, all the time. And mm. I played that, that young pro. So I've got a Panini sticker. Wow. <laughs> in a West Ham kit. It's really weird. I've, I'm like, like, I've played the shittest footballer in the world. <laughs> uh, but I've also played someone who's signed for like, like West Ham and has my own Panini sticker. It's really, really <laughs> odd. Um, so I did, a, I did a number of them, but I sort of lent away from it a bit as I got a bit older and, and mm. tried to sort of focus on on, on some of the and and at the point when I was trying to nudge towards some American work as well. Yeah, of course, of course. And you know, I think there's obviously um not in it. We're, we're more, sort of all, all more interested in the sort of football element of it. So in terms of that, I know recently you've got a film that you've been involved with called The Beautiful Game, which just in terms of I suppose it's the other side of the camera for you compared to what people might know. Yeah. You know, obviously in terms of playing football. So how hard is that to sort of we mentioned it earlier almost keep the football maybe authentic but also I suppose fit a narrative, yeah. doesn't it as well? Yeah, I think that's where Mike is. My brother really shows his his strength, and it's difficult because on, you could get onto a film set sometimes, and people just don't have the time or or resource to sort of really spend the time making it look yeah. good. And it's one of my pet peeves, really, about football projects. It's it's a sort of low bar, but it, but it, but as we talked about, but there's a this this beautiful game is it's just all I can really say is it's a wonderful script by um, by Frank Cottrell Boyce. Mm. He's a, a fantastic writer. It's a great director, and and I think they got the right. They just got the right melting pot of people who cared, yeah. and and um, it was an honour. I only went on and did some of the London leg. I've worked behind the scenes a little bit in my career, but I tend to not do too much of it just because of 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 being an actor. But um, I have technical advice with my brother on on a few jobs, including. Oh, doing some stuff. We did some stuff together with Bale a few years ago. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, which is cool. He's a lovely guy. And then, and I did one just on my own, actually, for Burger King some years ago with Jimmy Greaves. And and Jimmy and I were really close. It was really lovely. Another play my dad adored. <laughs> and we, we, we got really close working on that together. Um, but I assisted my brother on the London leg of, of, of The Beautiful Game. It, it just a you know long story short it's about a real thing that happens it's about the homeless world cup mm. i'm not going to say too much about it because i can't but all i can say all i can say is it's it's going to be a brilliant film and yeah. i think and i think the, the the football work in it is is pretty spectac- spectacular and i think uh, and, and 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 my brother's work on that it really shines and i was I, it was it was a privilege for me to be able to support and help mm. a little bit on that side of things but I think we got it right. I think we yeah. got it right on this. No, I was just going to say, we mentioned, it's a few years ago when we were doing various different pods when about 20 people listened to them, but um, we did mention about the Homeless World Cup. It obviously, it's a fairly recent sort of thing, but it's, you know, it's incredible yeah. 
even for a sort of cause cause for us in that sense. I was going to say there's a challenge to that because it's a four mm. side game, you know, and it's like it's like you've got. But anyway, yeah, watch it when it comes out. Just catch it. Make sure you catch it. <laughs> just before we uh, we finish, Mark, we always like to finish with the same sort of question um, that we ask everyone, really. Okay. So um, one of them is, as I suppose, given the work you've done in terms of both as an actor but as a football coach, what's maybe the best game of football you've been involved in? But then also, and this is one we always sort of like to ask, is as a football fan, so one that you couldn't have been directly involved in, whether it be on a TV or you happened to be at the ground, what was your favourite sort of game that you've ever seen? So basically two favourite games, one you're directly involved in, one as a fan. Oh, gosh. Um, I think there's a few that, that, that I really, gosh, that really come to mind as a, a, that I was involved in. Like we, we as a family, such a big family, the Delaney's, we have a, an 11 a side versus 11 a side. Um, <laughs> What usually once a year, but haven't through the pandemic, and it's and we get a crowd as well. That's our our entire family. Um, it's a big family, and I remember the first time my wife Emerald came to one, she was like, "What is this?" And I was like, "Yeah, they're all related to me." Um, <laughs> and so we call it the Delaney Day. Um, so, but uh, we've not played one for a while. Um, but I was really privileged to play in, in one of those Delaney days with one of my cousins, who was also a pro footballer, um, who's passed away now, too young. Um, from motor neuron disease. And so we, we got to play together. That was really amazing. And and there was another, back in the day when I used to do a lot of charity games when I was in football stuff, um, I played on QPR's pitch actually right. uh, in a charity match um, uh, in the sort of late nineties would have been early noughties. Um, and uh, I remember going up against the guy's name, I think, is James Crosley. He used to play Hunter in Gladiators. Right. <laughs> and, and at the time, he was sort of, you know, I think full on having his affair with Eureka Johnson or right. whatever it was. They were sort of together, weren't they, for a while? But um, He wasn't a small child, was he? No, he's a big guy. And I remember, uh, I was, I'm a left back, really. And um, I remember he was playing on the wing. So I was directly sort of yeah, having to deal with him. And I remember everyone was like, you know, this sort of David and Goliath sort of situation. I was like, good luck, mate. You know? <laughs> and uh, I remember he was pinging it. He was sort of like burning it down the wing at one point. And, and I was trying to track back with him. And I thought, I'm not going to really be able to keep possession. Mm. And I just sort of went in, slid straight through. <laughs> <laughs> put it out you know for a throw in and in typical british football style the crowd went mad like wild <laughs> i'd given the ball away but i sort of won the tackle <laughs> and uh he just went flying like like an absolute sack and uh and and was sort of appealing for a free kick and the ref was like what are you talking about he's put the ball straight out you know but i remember the crowd just went mad for me <laughs> because like i'd absolutely sort of like smashed him and I think just that that thing of like being a big guy, mm. it was like it was, he went down pretty hard. Uh, <laughs> there was a later moment in the game where it wasn't so evenly split, where we went up for a header, both of us, and he came down on my foot. And I, I, I mean, I don't think I broke my foot, but it was in a bad way for a while. Right. But yeah, that was a good, you know, in terms of like playing quite well. I think mm. that was quite good. The, the, the really weirdly, the match that really sticks in my mind as a as it was as a sort of like a as a viewer right yeah as or a fan a, basically or a, or yeah as a fan so this is a really weird one um first of all i've been to a bunch of lovely different games and and and, and uh, hospitality suites and i feel really fortunate to have gone to some mm. lovely charity shields over the years and seen some lovely stuff and we also in the euros uh some time ago my brother and i saw brazil play and it was incredible seeing the way Brazil pray together and, and, and prepare for a game. It's, it's been like that for years. And I, I do love it, actually, I've got to say. Mm. Um, but a game that really sticks in my mind is Hansi Muller, that we talked about earlier, for his 50th birthday. I mean, this is just incredible. Like, they recreated the Germany-Italy World Cup final for his oh, birthday wow. at VFB's pitch. <laughs> and so... It's just like insane. So we were invited, my brother being a really good friend of the family, as sort of like guests of honour. Right. Because my brother, Mike, uh, and I, I think my sister even came. Like we went, a bunch of us went, and um, we stayed in VFB's hotel attached to the ground. And so 
I thought, okay, they're going to recreate this final. It's going to be like this little thing where the, yeah. all the Italy players that were alive turned up and all the, and all the Germany players turned up. And they'd all been taking it seriously. They'd all been training, yeah. getting ready for this game. And so um, I got into the stadium. The stadium was packed. I thought it was going to be like, yeah, like what my brother was doing the skill show at halftime. It was a proper full stadium at VFB's ground. And, and watching these players who'd played the World Cup final, uh, you know, 30, 20, when would it have been? I can't remember the, the, the year they had the World Cup final, but it was those two. And just watching them do it again mm. as old boys and them still be brilliant was just like the most, and, and it was sort of, it was sponsored by Mercedes. So in, in, in Stuttgart, Mercedes is yeah. a museum and, and, and test center is really near um, the, the stadium. And obviously it's, dot, it's the Daimler Gottlieb stadium. So they, they drove all the players in on Mercedes <laughs> through the ages. And some of them were on like a Mercedes from like 1910, you know, <laughs> and it was just such a surreal experience to go and 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 we were all you know because we were Hansi's friends we were sort of treated like the players we went to mm. a, a launch event in the Mercedes museum we got to go in the test center and try the cars nice. um but watching that game and being part of that game was just like it's like we don't do it in England we'd no. never do that no. for a start we've we've not got to a world cup final like that no. <laughs> and, and, but it's like it was it was such a special event. They made such a big deal of it. Mm. Um, but seeing these old guys that had been playing together years ago yeah. still have that competitive spirit, it was quite a unique experience. Um, I, I think yeah. to bring it full circle, like you say, it's just that, that pure football, isn't it? Which is, I suppose, what we were mentioning at the beginning. Do you know what I mean? That love of the game and yeah. just that, that, not before Absolutely. nonsense kicked in, but, you know, all this other stuff that we maybe have nowadays. I think, like you say, that's maybe what the appeal to that game was, was like you say, it was just a bit... I mean, I know I said about Mercedes and whatever, but the actual players and just the love of playing football. Yeah, and... but it's funny, you know, the Mercedes sponsorship at, at VFB and stuff is is one of the things that, you know, keeps the ticket prices in general yeah. quite low in comparison yeah, to British true. football. You know, it's like, it's like it, it, mm. the idea, it was just a different feeling around football over there. I loved it. I always loved going over there as a coach. I, I you know, I loved the, the atmosphere and, and the way that, that my brother trained as well when he was out there. It was mm. very... It was like watching Rocky Rocky Four. <laughs> it's like it's like everyone took it really seriously, um, but it was really it was a joyful joyful experience. Yeah. yeah, I've got to say, Martin, four years of doing these interviews, I don't I ever expected uh, that to be an answer for um, whoever we're interviewing's favorite game. Normally, you get you know some of the more generic ones like yeah, Man United in '99 or something like that. So that, that that's so refreshing well, to it was, hear. Sort of. It was amazing because Hansi scored this incredible free kick. You know, it was his right. birthday. The wall was up, you know, and he scored this incredible free kick the way he would have done yeah. 25 years before, you know, yeah. in the top corner. And it's like, how is this man still doing that? Yeah. You know, I'll incredible. never forget it. I was right behind him when he lined up to take that free kick. And it was like, oh my God, you know, yeah. such a unique experience seeing these guys <laughs> still having it. A bit like the 66 team in Rejects, yes. you know. I was saying, I think I said to you before we recorded this, that if, I think you must be a real good pub quiz question answer of who's, you know, I have played with. And then if you list all of these He's people, played, yeah. you know, the ger yeah, exactly. generation, I don't know how that would work, but yeah, I think you'd be, you know, you'd be quite good for pub it'd be, quiz. It'd be know. even too obscure, wouldn't it? For people yes, to yeah. really like, get it, it would be like, what? <laughs> but yeah, what a, what a privilege to play with those people. Yeah. Do you know what, Martin? It's been an absolute pleasure. I'm aware of, you know, how busy a day you've had. So I, I can't thank you enough for giving up your time. And obviously I know you've got lots of projects coming out, but, one that we're very keen to watch would be that one, you know, the beautiful game, which you of know, course, comes out of next course. year. We would like to, uh, yeah, would like to sort of yeah, go. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, no, no, well, look, if, if anyone's sort of fancying a night off football, Rosie Malloy's on Sky with yes. Sheridan Smith and then Christmas Carol's out on Christmas Eve with Sam yeah. Jones. It's not going to be quite football orientated, but... No, 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 but... It might be a refreshing little, a little watch. <laughs> Especially after the World Cup as well. I think we probably need a break. Exactly. Today, so yeah, but no. Exactly. Martin, it's been, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. And as I said, I'll, I'll hopefully get a picture of me and my Rent for a Reject shirt when it turns up. Send it to me, Charlie, when you get it. Please do. <laughs>